Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! On Top Gear, we spend a lot of time extolling the virtues of powerful cars. Naturally, we're aware that for many, such machines are little more than unattainable dreams. But we're also aware that for some, seeing is not enough. They are prepared to steal to get the thrill, and unfortunately their thrill involves driving so wildly that death can result. This week, the government began to force through legislation to control joyriding. So tonight, we investigate the dreadful cost in money and lives. A secret police operation involving five forces across the Midlands. They're targeting joyriding. It's the fastest growing crime in the country. For every offence detected, hundreds of others remain unsolved. It's a terrible pressure on limited police resources. Nobody knows what happened here. A group of youngsters, perhaps 15 years old, were seen running away. At enormous expense, there's a full emergency alert. In the event, no one's hurt. But Sergeant John Perrins is heartily sick of the kids responsible. It appears that the youth club's gone out of fashion and uh, joyriding is in. Whereas in the old days, people stole cars to go home. They don't do that anymore. They, they do it now for the fun of it. And this is where the term joyriding has crept into it. In actual fact, it's taking a vehicle without the owner's consent. What do you think about calling them joyriders? Well, we don't rate it much because there's, there's no joy in, in damaging other people's property, seriously injuring people or killing people, which has happened. And there's absolutely no joy in that whatsoever. Suddenly, there are reports of a car careering towards central Birmingham at speed on the wrong side of the road. Police policy is not to pursue if lives will be risked. An impossible decision. Uphold the law or let them go. Hang on, I two city centre on the way. A lot of the time, of course, they uh, quite apparent that they go out to bait the police, uh, you know, ju just to for the fun of it, which is very frightening, really, because they're, they're waiting for the police to come uh, so that a pursuit situation develops. And, of course, when you get a pursuit situation, you've got road danger. What are you hoping to be able to do? Down here somewhere. What we're not going to do is get involved in a collision. What we don't do is put a roadblock on. There are now nine vehicles and a motorcycle giving chase. The police helicopter is above. To reduce the danger, they use the minimum number of cars for the trap they're planning. Mind you, can you pull some of these motors off? Pull some of these Zulus off? What are you planning to do now? Is there any We're way hoping to get him boxed in by the motorway and to stop him. <laughs> trying to get away, trying to damage police vehicles. Hold him, slow him, slow him, slow him. Well done, well done. Keep him in, keep him in. Yeah, he's up the curb. He's up the curb. Well done. The other side of the city, a disastrous end to an attempted car theft. Youngsters screamed across a red light junction, injuring two people whose car was wrecked. Those responsible have fled. The extraordinary increase in the problem is almost totally unresearched and unexplained. Despite this, the government has decided that tougher sentencing is the solution. The aggravated vehicle taking bill proposes five years imprisonment and unlimited fines. But the fact is that these powers exist in similar form already. They're not used because many of the offenders are children. And Home Office advice for many years has been that they should be kept firmly out of the court system. So surely the question now really is, why do they do it? And how on earth can we stop what is fast becoming a national epidemic? It's tragic but true that accidents like these do not act as a warning to the youngsters whose tearaway games can end in such destruction. There is a foolish youthful certainty that this could never happen to them. That's what one teenager thought when earlier this year he sped along this road in Leeds in a stolen Golf GTI, racing with another stolen Golf. He swerved onto the wrong side of the road, killing two pedestrians. He didn't stop until he slammed into a wall. This is the boy who did it. He's just 18 years old, serving three and a half years in a young offender's institution for causing death by reckless driving. Murderer, murderer. I was listening to, to the news at one stage, and they were saying that the police are looking for the murderer. 
It was the end of three years of twocking, taking without the owner's consent. He admits now to at least 700 thefts, 70 before he was caught the first time, and frighteningly, his friends did the same. Showing off, mainly. I would say, yeah, showing off in front of everybody. Look, he's got a 16 valve there, it's faster than that, what you've got there. And then he'll go get a Cosworth, and then you'll try to go get someone that can compete with it. That's all it is, racing up and down. I just want to drive again, that's it. Just want to suck him on, on my mind for the rest of my life, that I've killed two people. Just can't believe what I've done. Just feel my stupidity and that, driving reckless. And that. Just showing him off to the people and the families and that. Because I know that if somebody had killed my son or daughter, I know what I, I, I would have done anyway. Do you think that's a message perhaps to other joy riders? What would you say? To others. To other dry riders will say that they'll be thinking now that they'll be sitting now, they're thinking now and saying it will happen to them. But believe me, it could happen to them, it could happen to any one of them. All it's got to be is just a loss of control of the car and that's it. They could even be killing themselves of mine other people. But remorse comes too late to save lives, and joyriders have an appalling record for reoffending. This institution is so concerned, it's starting a program to prevent them doing it again when they get out. But after such killing, should they get out? Residents on this Newcastle estate have clear views on that. One night last year, a 10-month-old baby was killed. Those responsible were 14 and 15. I'm just coming back from uh, Shirley's mum's. We used to pop up every evening. We were just walking down, and then uh, the car comes screeching around the corner. The police were following, and they just collided into the pram. The two youths just jumped out of the car. Got grabbed Shirley. I went for the bend, but it wasn't quick enough. What do you think should happen to people that do things like that? They should be put away for life. They took a life. I mean, the child hadn't even started. Just basically, he just started to live his life, and all of a sudden. Two youths come along and take it away and get two years for it. Should have got banged up for life. The very next night after the accident, the kids were out doing it. You know, so, I mean, where's the respect? They ain't got nothing. <laughs> no heart. Across the country, police forces we've spoken to report anything up to a 40% increase in this type of offence in a year. Joyriders usually start as passengers and progress to the driver's seat. So the run that results in an accident is almost never the first. The warning signs are there long before. But the police increasingly believe that parents choose not to see them and not to act. We've got to look, as I say, at the parents' role in all this. It's absolutely scandalous that youngsters of 12, 13 and 14 are out to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning stealing vehicles. You speak to any of my officers, they're arresting the same people 15 or 16 times in a year. They're actually appearing before a court on occasions that many times. And they're still being allowed out either on bail or not getting custodial sentences, so they're free to commit the same sort of offence again. Do you think that they should be getting heavier custodial sentences? Well, you know, I'm not a, a member of the lock em up brigade. I agree with the government that the last thing we should do is to put young people into prison or give them custodial sentences. But what we must do if we're not going to lock them up, to protect the public, we've got to find a viable alternative to custody. And I'm afraid there doesn't at the moment seem to be a viable alternative. Joan is the mother of a joyrider. Her 16-year-old son, Mark, is not in custody. He's dead. He was a passenger in a car driven by a 15-year-old, which crashed, racing another stolen vehicle. I remember walking in, seeing him lying on the table with a white sheet over him. And uh, I put my hands to his face to warm him, thinking he'd been playing football or fishing, something like that. He was freezing. It was like a block, solid block of ice. And uh, I just stood and kissed him and cuddled him and everything. I just couldn't understand that he was lying there dead. Only after the crash did Mark's secret other life finally emerge. He'd been caught before by police in a waterboard van. Now she wonders how many other times. You didn't even know that your son could drive, though, did you? I didn't know at all. I didn't know that my son was dead and buried two weeks after. Where had he learnt to drive? Through these lads, I reckon, that he uh, hung around with, yes. And he was a brilliant driver, I was told, because I was told the night that that accident happened, if Mark had driven that car, he would have been here today. But if Mark had driven that car and he had done 
what this other lad's done to my son. I would have crippled him. I would have killed him and put him away. Did you accuse him of being involved in joyriding, stealing? I accused him of the waterboard van that he was accused of stealing, but all I kept getting was a remark, I didn't do it, ma'am, and you know I didn't do it, and he had a cover for it and everything, and all the way through, I believed it until two weeks after he died.